I guess in general, like fractions are, are one of the more difficult topics that kids encounter in uh, late primary and, and early middle school. If you remember fractions being one of the harder subjects in school, then you're not alone. Averaging across three different studies, 6th to 8th graders failed around 41% of questions about fractions. And even college students failed around 20%. There's a study of the labor market that I like to cite, uh, which asked um, adult uh, working people in the United States uh, in a large random sample that included white and blue collar employees, um, what kinds of math they use in their work, if any. I think it was about two thirds of them said that they use rational numbers, meaning fractions, decimals, or percentages, um, which is pretty high. Um, and that was the only, I, or rather, I should say, that was the most advanced form of math that was mentioned by more than half of the participants. So there was a, a steep drop off after fractions, even let's say the next advanced topic after fractions is algebra, and only about 25% of the participants said that they use algebra. So uh, it seems that fractions are kind of the most advanced form of math that a majority of adults actually need to use in their lives after school. I got the opportunity to speak with Dr. Braithwaite about why fractions are so difficult and what we can do about it. My name is David Braithwaite. I'm an assistant professor in the uh, psychology department. Uh, my main area is developmental psychology, and I'm also cross-listed in cognitive. So I study cognitive development, which is just, uh, you know, development of children's thinking abilities. My area of specialty is uh, math learning. Um, so I'm interested in how children learn math and uh, whether we can find ways to teach math more effectively. Uh, the topics that I currently am looking at are uh, fractions and decimals. And I'm also starting to branch out a little into algebra in terms of math topics. But there are a few particular uh, things that the research has focused on. One of them is just understanding the basic idea that a fraction is a number, a single number, because a fraction is written as two numbers, uh, a numerator and a denominator. And so a lot of children have trouble understanding that those two numbers together represent one number and uh, relating the, that one number to another number. So often when they're asked to do things with fractions, they'll tend to just do things with the numerator and do other things with the denominator than the fraction as a whole. Um, so for instance, if you ask a child, uh, which is bigger, like two fifths or one half? Well, in fact, one half is bigger, but they might say, well, the two and two fifths is bigger than the one and one half, and the five and the two fifths is bigger than the two and the one half, and so it looks like two fifths is bigger. The standard approach used in schools is to teach a fraction as a, a number of parts of a whole, and the typical representation will be to show a pie or a pizza, that's cut into a certain number of pieces and you take a certain number of those pieces. For instance, you take three out of three pieces. And this conceptualization um, really actually encourages children to keep thinking of a fraction as two separate numbers, uh, which is exactly the problem. You know, it's not what we should encourage, it's what we should keep away from. Um, a conceptualization that, that I like um, that's partly original to me and partly, you know, a repackaging of things other people have said, um, is thinking of a fraction as the result of iterating a unit a certain number of times. Um, and that language is kind of mysterious, but what it means is really if you think of what we do when we're counting, like if you're counting apples, for example, you count you know, five apples, what you're basically saying an apple is a unit and I'm going to take five copies of that unit. That's what the number five means. And that basic idea applies to anything that you can count. You know, if you measure something, you measure that it's five feet long, in that case, a foot is a unit, and you're taking five copies of that unit. Well, if you think of a fraction like uh, five eighths, um, you can similarly think of an eighth as being a unit, and you're taking five copies of that unit. I think this conceptualization is, is better than the typical part whole uh, conceptualization because it encourages. Um, people to think of um, a fraction as, as having a magnitude um, that is represented by its length, if you were to use that bar analogy. Um, and it also encourages them to think of um, fractions as essentially the same as whole numbers. The basic idea is you have a unit and you repeat it. It's the same for fractions and whole numbers. The innovation with fractions is that um, you can have units of different sizes. You can have eighths and thirds and fourths, and you can mix those units together. And so that adds a complication 
but the fundamental idea that you have a unit that is repeated is the same. So um, I think that helps to use children's prior knowledge about whole numbers in a more productive way um, that's actually active. Children have to learn um, a set of procedures for dealing and uh, there's you know, one procedure for adding or subtracting fractions with like denominators, another one for unlike denominators, yet another procedure for multiplying, another one for dividing. And uh, most children don't have a very good understanding of why you use each procedure when you do and why you use other procedures for other situations. So they very easily get confused about which procedure they're supposed to use. So they'll use uh, a procedure that would be correct on a multiplication problem, but they would use it on an, an addition problem or vice versa. Um, and so that kind of confusion between operations is maybe the primary source of mistakes in fraction table six. Um, and you know, if you were just to look at children's performance, which is usually pretty poor, uh, you might think that they're not learning what they're supposed to learn. But in a sense, actually, they are learning what they're supposed to learn. That is to say, they're learning all those procedures. But what they're not learning is when they're supposed to use each of them. Uh, so I would sort of summarize their, their errors as doing the right thing at the wrong time. Uh, that happens quite often. Something that I've noticed when looking at math textbooks is that uh, most of the time, they present problems for practice in blocks, uh, where within a block, uh, students are very repetitively practicing a single thing over and over. So you might have a block of 20 addition and subtraction problems, uh, all of which use the same procedure. And then in the next section of the book, you'll have uh, a block of multiplication problems, and in another later section, a block of division problems. And so this kind of practice does not give children the chance to practice precisely the thing that they have the most difficulty with, with which is to decide which procedure to use. Uh, because when you give them a block of 20 addition problems, you're clearly telling them, okay, you use the addition procedure for all the problems in this block, and you don't need to think about it at all. Uh, I think children would benefit greatly from having a much higher proportion of practice where different types of problems were mixed together. And so you'd have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division all in the same block. And so they have to get used to the idea of thinking, okay, which of the different procedures that I have learned am I supposed to use this time? And they have to face that question on every single problem in the block, so they'll get more practice thinking about that. And uh, I think that would go a long way to uh, resolving that difficulty. Some people will do research like what I do that sort of, it's like a test of, uh, a, a test of concept. Uh, it will show that something may be a good idea in principle, but it doesn't show that it's actually good in practice. You know, to show that these ideas are truly effective, you would need to uh, develop interventions based on these ideas and uh, test them in a randomized controlled trial. Um, and there are other researchers that do that. Um, I don't really do that too much, but other researchers do that, um, testing things in a more um, realistic classroom setting and testing whether they actually work or not. And I think once something is shown to be effective in that kind of test, then it does get more attention from people at a higher level in, in uh, of education policy making and instructional design. Um, but that's sort of a, a degree of, of separation from, removed from what I do. So I guess my hope is that my work, which is a little closer to theory and further from practice, will get taken up by those other researchers who do the work that's closer by practice, uh, closer to practice, and then eventually from there get taken up by practitioners.